So let's get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining our ICON seminar today. So today we have the honor to have uh, Professor Jiang Hai Fu to join us. Uh, Professor Jiang Hai received uh, his uh, bachelor's degree in automatic control from Xi'an Jiaotong University and uh, the master's degree in mathematics and PhD degree in electrical engineering, both from UC Berkeley. He is uh, currently a professor uh, with the EC department here at Purdue, and uh, his research interests include distributed solution of network optimization and games, hybrid systems, and uh, energy efficient building control. So today, Zhang Hai will tell us about his research uh, about uh, a dandy learning approach to continuous multi agent games. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Yi. Yeah. Uh, so it is a pleasure to be here to present some of my recent work. Actually, uh, this is mostly the work of my students, uh, uh, Yuan Hanqin. Uh, as you see the first name uh, there. So the topic is about solving um, multi agent games uh, with continuous action space. And also under the assumption that we don't know the gradient information, we can only receive blended feedback. Namely, the only feedback we will receive will be the value function, I mean, the objective function value only. All right, so this is the outlines of the talk. Um, so uh, first, I will just give an introduction. And also, second part is the main part about the blended uh, uh, so learning of, uh, algorithm for solving such game. And then third part, we will consider there will be delay in receiving the feedback. And also the last part will be trying to use the improved estimation scheme. Most likely I will uh, cover only the second and third part, depending on the time, of course. All right, uh, so for the first part, so let me start, uh, if you remember when we solve optimization problem, a constraint optimization problem, we try to find a minimizer x, uh, taking value in a feasible set, minimizing an objective function. And uh, so the subtle point is one step further. So, so you can think of this one as a two player game. One is minimizing, the other one is maximizing an objective function. Uh, the game that we study will be multi player games. Uh, each player i will has its own objective function, f super i here. It can make decisions on its local decision variable, x super i here. Uh, that local decision variable will have a local feasible set, calligraphic x of i there. This notation x super minus i is basically a concatenation of the decision from all other player. So, which means that the, the objectives of player i will depend on the actions of all the other player as well. If you have a network structure, this may dependency may be modeled by a graph. But we are considering the general case here. So these players are self-interested in a sense that they're only interested in minimizing their own objective function. There's no coordination among them. All right, so let's look at several examples. The first one is driving in the city traffic and each driver will be a player. Uh, it has the goals of trying to reach certain destination. Uh, the objective function will be to be minimized will be the time it takes to reach the destination here. As you can see, he will make routing decision and the time it takes for him to actually drive his de destination will depend on the other driver's decision as well because the traffic congestion can be uh, caused by a driver taking the same route. And in this case, as you can see, uh, we encounter this situation that uh, for each driver, uh, he doesn't know or he doesn't know how the time, travel time will be determined explicitly. That would be too complicated a, a function. And also the other driver may not share their routing decision with them in real time. And so this is a case you can only use the current road condition kind of a banded feedback, only the objective function value uh, to or predictive travel time to uh, modify his decision. Another similar example will be the uh, trying to transport a uh, commodity in a highway network, which is very similar to this. I'll omit that one. Another example will be, well, if you have a clusters of building 
each one consume energy to, to satisfy its own uh, need for building comfort, for example. And the total utility and the utility received by each building will depends on two things. One is the actual power consumption multiplied by the utility cost. That's same for everyone, for every building. But then within this cluster, the total consumption, there will be a peak value during a given period of time, like say a month. And that peak value will incur a large demand charge. And that will be distributed in certain way to the individual building area. So in this case, the utility cost of, I mean, the bill for each building will also depend on the power usage of the other building in the same cluster due to this combined peak demand value there. But again, um, different building may be, other building may be reluctant to share their uh, power usage information strategy with you. And uh, that's something that uh, you can, due to privacy or other consideration. Uh, these are two simple examples from machine learning, uh, which can both be modified as two player game and then max problem. And uh, so similar problem can be encountered when we study resilient controls of cyber physical system under adversarial attack, two players basically. All right, so let me start from the familiar topic, optimization. So let's say my goal is to optimize an, an objective function is this feasibility constraint. If the objective function is differentiable, then it's gradient is, is a useful operator because we can use it to define solution. We can also use it in the solution algorithm, for example, gradient descent kind of algorithm. And this is an example for a simple objective function, the gradient field. Now, when you look at multiplayer games, there is an operator that plays a similar role, which is called the pseudo gradient or simply P gradient operator. This operator is obtained by just stacking the local partial derivatives. For example, for player I, this is the partial derivatives of his own objective function with respect to his own decision variable, xi here, assuming the other actions are given. And when you stack them together for all players, you get the uh, student gradient operator. For example, in this two player game with this two objective function, this is the pseudo gradient field there. Now, this will play the same role as gradient operator for optimization problem when solving multi-player uh, games. Now, uh, we know that in optimization problem, convex optimization is an important family of problem because they uh, can we can use very efficient algorithm for their solution. Uh, when the objective function is convex, then the gradient will have this property called monotonicity. And this property is written here. When X, the decision the optimization variable is a scalar, this is nothing but saying that the derivative of F is monotonically non-decreasing. Uh, the normal, I mean, familiar condition for convexity. But this is the correct way to, to write this condition when you have multi-dimensional decision variable X there. So uh, similarly, you can expect that uh, for the game situation, uh, the pseudo gradient operator having monotonicity property will be easier to solve. And that is indeed the case. In the next slide, I will present uh, classifications of game based on the different levels of monotonicity. And I won't bore you, bore you with the detailed definition. Uh, for example, this is just nothing but the previous definition with the gradient replaced by the pseudo gradient for the gain there. If the pseudo gradient operator satisfies one, then we call this one monotone or just merely monotone. And that is this class of gain. But you can definitely impose stronger condition. You will get strictly monotone and strongly monotone that will be smaller and smaller families of gain. But you can also weaken this condition. You get pseudo monotone gains and nearly coherent gain. These are also some relaxations of these Type slightly larger one, and uh, in particular, 
Later on, we will develop algorithm that can guarantee convergence for student monotone plus game and, and also for merely monotone game. I just want to point out that these two families neither contain each other as a subclass. Uh, whenever you have a C arrow here, it just means that this is a subclass of this here. Uh, so we will have convergence result for these two. In, in the fourth part, we will try to derive algorithm that converge for the broadest uh, game in this classification tree here. All right. Uh, so, uh, so let me define the game. So we all are familiar with the classical definitions of game, namely the Nash equilibrium point. So Nash equilibrium point is such that assuming all the other players uh, uh, fix their decision, uh, no player can benefit by unilaterally change this decision to something else by lowering its objective function uh, in doing that. And that is just the classical definitions of Nash equilibrium point. But in this talk, I'm going to use an alternative definitions of solution called the critical point. And it is defined in terms of the pseudo gradient operator. And if it just said that it should, for uh, the X star to be a critical point, it should satisfy this condition for arbitrary speed of point, point, point X there. And geometrically, we just say that at the base point X star, uh, the negative of the pseudo gradient should be pointing toward the direction that lie in the normal cones of the feasible set at this base point. If you replace this P with the gradient operator, this is exactly the same definition for critical point in solving constraint convex optimization problem. So this is just generalization to this game case using pseudo gradient operator. Although in general, this will define a different kind of a, a more a weaker sense of solution compared to the Nash driven point, but under some fairly mild condition, these two actually coincide. For example, when uh, individual objective functions are convex and also continuously differentiable in their own decision variable, that's pretty reasonable, uh, easy to, to, to meet. In that case, the two are the same. Uh, but this one is much easier to study for the convergence analysis. So that's the concept we will be adopting. All right, uh, so uh, the, we all know that the, when solving constraint optimization problem, projected gradient descent is a popular algorithm. Now let's try to borrow that and apply it to solve the game problem here. And so this is called a projected pseudo gradient descent algorithm. The idea is very simple, just uh, starting from the current guess of the solution, perform a gradient descent. This is done in parallel by all player. Each one take the gradient descent with respect to its local gradient, with respect to its own decision variable, and then project back to its local feasible set here. So all the agents doing this simultaneously. And uh, so it can be shown that this is actually not that a solution strategy. It will converge to a critical point under assumptions that the, the pseudo gradient operator is strictly monotone and ellipsis, uh, as is the example here. Uh, this is one that is, this will work here. Uh, but uh, this is also has some drawback here. Uh, the first one is that, like I mentioned in the you know, city traffic example, uh, oftentimes the player may not know exactly the functional form of this objective function. That could be too complicated, or it's just simply it has no knowledge of that function. Second, to compute the local partial gradient, you also need to know the decision from all the other players. For various reasons, the other player may not share that with you. So oftentimes you don't have access to this local gradient directly. And the second, um, it, this is assuming that, that you will, once you take an action, the current guess of the solution, you instantly know the gradient. But oftentimes in practice, this takes some delay for you to get. For example, you, if you have to estimate this gradient by using uh, sampling the, the, the objective function value, it takes some time for the objective function value to be returned to you by the oracle or the environment. Uh, so there will be delay involved. 
And another serious limitation is that uh, for convergence, it requires strict monotonicity that is often too strong. A very popular class of game is given by the bilinear games, where the objective function will be bilinear functions. Uh, for example, this is one case where I have two pair, basically a subtle point problem. Two pair with uh, one with this as, as the objective function, the other one with the necklace of this as this objective function. So this is a zero sum game, basically. Uh, so this is a bilinear function, bilinear function. So this is the bilinear game. And also uh, other case will be the generative adversarial network and the subtle point solution. Oftentimes, if you linearize this, you can see that it's given by a screw symmetric matrix defined bilinear game. Uh, with screw symmetric matrix, this is the type of games that are actually monotone, but the, probably the furthest away from uh, strictly monotone. And as you can see for this example, this is given by a school symmetric matrix defined by the inner gain. And if you write the pseudo gradient field, you see that following the field flow, you will be traveling around this concentric circle around the unique subtle point solution. And therefore, if you use follow the projected gradient descent, which is just simply gradient descent because we don't have a feasible set here, you will be just moving further and further away from the solution there. So that's the projected gradient descent will not work for this example here. All right, uh, now that's where our next part will come from. So we will propose algorithms that do not utilize uh, gradient information, only using standard feedback. Uh, feedback about the value functions, the, the, the objective function value only and use as few such feedback as possible for iteration. And also we will try to design algorithm better gradient descent scheme that will converge for a broader class of things. So that's the goals of the second part. So this is an overview of the, the algorithm. And at the end of each iteration, player I will produce some action. And uh, so do all the other player. After all these actions are decision, decided, it will be passed to the environment or the Oracle. The Oracle will determine the cost function value for all the individual player. In, in particular, the player I's objective function value will be returned as a banded feedback here. And using this banded feedback about the objective function value, player I will first try to estimate the local gradient. Remember, he doesn't know the, uh, the gradient directly, so I have to estimate. And using the estimate, go through some gradient descent scheme and update is action. Sometimes this, this action may not be feasible. So you have to do some post-processing to make it feasible again. And also, he may also throw in some random exploration here uh, for the purpose of helping the gradient estimation in the next step. So this is an overview of the algorithm. So in, in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about uh, these two major components. One is which gradient descent scheme should I use? And when I discuss that, I will assume first that I have perfect local gradient information. But then next, I will talk about how to estimate the gradient descent. When you put these two together, together you will have a combined algorithm and I will, I will present the result of convergence there. All right, so let's see which uh, gradient descent should I use? Well, there's a, a very popular gradient descent scheme that generalized the projected gradient descent called the mirror descent. And the idea is that, well, starting from the base point XK, suppose I have the gradient, I mean, this is talking about the optimization problem. So this is the, the gradients of the objective function. This is the step size. Normally, you will just add this part to xk in a primal space. That's the normal gradient descent. But in mirror descent, you can see that I map this point to another point in the do space, and then I perform the gradient descent in the in the in the do space. 
And after the subject, I pull it back to the feasible set in a primal space using the inverse of this one, followed by an implicit projections onto the feasible set. And uh, so the way that we map this one to the dual space is by the so-called distant generating function, psi, uh, is, which is assumed to be strongly convex you know, with respect to a certain norm on the primal space so that this is one-to-one -one mapping. And this is the inverse of this one, but really also uh, taking into consideration that the result should lie in the feasible set. So this is the implicit projections onto the feasible set return back to this next uh, iteration value there. So why do I use this instead of the normal uh, main projected gradient descent? Oh, by the way, so this is, I will just denote this simple procedure as the prox mapping by this. It's just one mirror graded, gradient descent step. Uh, starting from the base point SK, following this gradient direction, and using this as a step size and also project back to the feasible set X. So why do I use mirror descent rather than just straightforward projected gradient set? Well, first, this is the generalization of the typical one. If you choose this uh, distant generating function to be just the norm square divided by two, and then you just recover the standard one. And better yet, for certain problem, the optimization variable lie in, for example, probability simplex, well, the set of all non-negative vectors that sum up to one. And uh, so, for example, when you are trying to optimize a finite dimensional probability distribution, that's the thing that you're trying to optimize. This will be the space. And suppose, typically for two distribution, we use L L1 norm to measure the distance of two. I mean, there's one popular choice for, for measuring the distance between two distributions. In that case, if you have a point lying outside of this uh, feasible set, you project using the L1 norm, that solution will be non-trivial, especially when the dimension is high. Uh, but instead, if we choose the distance general function to be, say, the negative entropy, in this case, this mirror map will be really simple. Just component-wise, I mean, operation, the softmax operation, and then followed by a weighted average to make it back to the probability syntax. So in this case, the computation cost will be much reduced. Uh, but, uh, well, let's just try to use this mirror descent on the game. We replace the uh, gradient operator with the pseudo gradient operator F here. We try to apply it to the game solution. And unsurprisingly, the convergence requirement will be the same as the projected gradient. We still need strict monotone games for this to work, plus maybe a Lipschitz continuity, a Lipschitz condition. Uh, now, we can improve the convergence property by employing the so-called extra gradient descent. The idea is very simple. We follow the gradient descent in the previous step, same as before. Uh, but we don't use the result directly as the next uh, value. We treat it as a leading state, or you can think of it as a probe, probing state, tentative state. We evaluate the uh, gradient again, uh, the P, uh, partial gradient again, uh, pseudo gradient again at this new location. And then we return back to the base point. We perform a mirror descent, but using the gradient at this future direction, the probing location here. And the motivations of doing this one is that this can help improve the convergence property. And especially it can be shown that now instead of the strict monotonicity, I only need monotonicity, just merely monotone game will be fine. And that will include the popular families of games such as bilinear games here. In fact, it can converge for even broader class of things, as is demonstrated by this example. You can see that this is, a, a, again, two-player game, uh, zero-sum game, uh, with one of the cost function being this, bilinear function plus this exponential term that is neither convex nor concave in mm. x1 or x2 there. So if you compute the pseudo-gradient uh, pseudo operator, it is not even uh, monotone. Uh, so let alone, I mean, so it doesn't satisfy this property. 
if you apply the mirror descent starting from this point, you will see that uh, the solution sequence will converge to some limit cycle. It will definitely not converge to the unique subtle point solution here, half half basically. Uh, but if you apply the retrograde descent, you can see that the solution sequence will eventually converge to the subtle point solution. So this actually works not just for monoton gain, it's actually probably for even broader cast of gain. This does improve the convergence problem. Uh, so this will be the one that we will choose, but then there's a drawback as well. Uh, so I copy the extra gradient descent procedure here. The drawback basically lies in com computational complexity. You have to evaluate the pseudo gradient at two different locations, two new gradient locations per iteration. And we have to use banded feedback to do this. We have to use at least two banded feedback. Each one can come very costly. I, I, I will try to avoid doing that. Uh, and also we have to evaluate this mirror map twice. And each one uh, will have some implicit projection onto this feasible set X. If a feasible set has complicated shape, that projection operation will uh, not project. The constraint optimization problem may uh, be time consuming. Uh, so to alleviate those drawbacks, uh, what we can do is that we will just do something simpler rather than using the, uh, the pseudo gradient at the base point. You can see one way is just to use the, uh, the pseudo gradient at the previous uh, probing stage, which I have already obtained in the previous step. And so I don't, there's no need to compute this one. In the previous iteration, I already have this one there. So the only new gradient I need will be this, this one here. And this one will be again, utilized in the next iteration. Here. So this time, by this, I will reduce the number of uh, uh, pseudo gradient evaluation uh, per iteration to one. And, uh, but I still have to perform two mirror maps evaluation. There's an even simpler one called the reflected mirror descent. And this is obtained by, as you can see, instead of use, uh, evaluating this, I use this uh, distance generating function, the partial, uh, the, the, the gradients of this one. Typically this will have closed form solution and that will be immediately computable. Nothing fancy there. And also I replace this feasible set with unconstrained problem. So I don't have to solve a constraint optimization problem for the step, first step. Typically this just will be very simple, just a simple reflection across a certain plane. That is the simplest possible you can expect for an update here. So all the computation complexity come from the second step and that will have a much reduced complexity uh, compared to the extra gradient descent. And uh, so in this paper, uh, it is shown that these two will have similar convergence property as extra gradient descent, but we reduced demand on the partial, I mean, uh, these gradient information and the mirror map evaluation, et cetera. Of course, these are under the assumptions that we know the precise values of the, uh, the, the pseudo gradient. Each F operator, we need to know the exact value. And all the analysis here assume that, which we don't uh, in our setting. We have to use banded feedback, only the objective function value to estimate these. And these estimate will come at the, this error here. So we have to take into consideration these error. So let's try to look at the next part. How do I estimate the partial gradient for each player with respect to its own decision? All right, so this is one existing scheme called the simultaneous perturbation and stochastic approximation. Uh, the idea is very simple. Each player I, starting from the base location, this is the place I want to evaluate the partial, uh, the local gradient, local partial gradient. So starting from this base location, uh, the player I will adopt a, a perturbed action. The perturbation is obtained by first choosing a random unit vector, that's the direction you want to perturb, and then perturb along this direction by a query reader's delta k that is identical across all players. 
in every player doing the same perturbation, so these are the perturbed values of their action, then we submit each action to the environment and everybody will, re will receive the standard feedback about their objective function value. In particular, this is the value received by the player I. And using this value here, you can see that this is to multiply this value with the random direction, multiply with the state dimensions of player I for the action space, divided by the query radius. This very simple expression will produce an estimate for the local partial gradients of Fi at the base point here. Uh, so that's my, I mean, that's just this estimate. Uh, when you, this is of course a random variable. This, this is random here. When you take expectation, this actually does not agree with the true. I mean, it's a, it's a bias estimate. Uh, if you replace this Fi with the smooth versions of Fi, smooth over a delta k radius sphere, uh, it will actually be unbiased. But we, uh, but the, for the original one, this is indeed introduce some bias there. You know? And also there will be some randomness through in as well. And for convergence analysis, because eventually we will be using these with the two, uh, I mean, these two algorithm, optimistic mirror descent and reflective mirror descent, the error will get propagated, et cetera. So we have to control the growth of these error. And uh, so in general, we have to carefully choose all these parameters, the query radius, mm -hmm. and also the step size gamma k. And the step size gamma k will be the, uh, the one that you perform the mirror descent step. We have to carefully choose these two parameters to balance two different kind of uh, error. One is the bias, the called so-called systematic error, which decrease as you decrease, if you choose a smaller exploration or query radius, the, the bias will be small. Uh, but because the query radius will re appear as this one over delta k here, the stochastic error, which is the variance of the zero mean part will increase at this rate. So that's something that we have to think carefully. One decrease with delta k, the other one increase really fast with delta k. And those can be modulated by proper choice of the step size because all we need is just the product of the gamma k with these two to go to zero sufficiently fast. One way we can do this is to choose delta, uh, the step size to go to zero really fast, for example, by satisfying this condition. But that's, that is really not desirable. Whenever you make the step size go to zero too fast, it means that you're updating less and less quickly and you're moving slower and slower, that, that will make the algorithm converge slower. That's not the ideal solution. Another one will be to try to control the growth of stochastic, not having this fast growth there. And as you can see, I will use one extra query about the base points objective function, and then take the uh, differentiation, uh, I mean, the uh, difference between these two and in this case, I can show that the stochastic error, rather than increasing with the query radius fast like this, it will stay bounded. That's a very good news here. That means that I will can put much less constraints on my uh, step size gamma k decaying rates there. I, have, I can make it uh, stay large longer. Uh, but of course, the downside will be that you have to take one more query, one banded feedback. So that will be, uh, could be very costly, time consuming, require the coordinations of other players as well. All right, so I produced the, reproduced the two estimates here. So here is one scheme that combined the benefits of these two. And uh, so you can see that it's similar to this, but instead of using a Query at the new base point, I use the query from the previous iteration. Just like the, I mean, when I redesigned the, the actual gradient descent approach, I, I used the previous iterations information for this one here. So that will be the so called the residual pseudo gradient estimate. This way, this is the only new banded feedback I need. And with this difference, I also can help maintain the 
uh, control the growth of variance for the estimation error. So in that case, I apply this estimator in this in the previous two schemes, the optimistic mirror descent reflect the mirror descent, I get this combined algorithm. Those will be our proposed algorithm there. And of course, uh, I cannot use the, the true gradient at the leading state. I have to replace them with my estimate here. So that's the one. But there's only one bended feedback required uh, per step for both algorithms there. All right, uh, so it can be shown that uh, by combining these, the, to maintain the stochastic error being bounded, I only need to choose my step size to satisfy this condition, which is to, it just simply means that the step size need to grow uh, decay faster than the current radius uh, decay. Um, then if you compare it with the condition that ensure the, the same conclusion for the SPSA es estimate, this condition is much stronger, and therefore it put much, I mean, stronger constraints on how fast this gamma k should decay there. So it can be expected that our algorithm will convert faster. All right, so uh, here I will, I will omit all the proof. I'll just directly present the conclusion. So the first results saying that for pseudo monoton plus gain, the actual sequence of plate, which are the, the, the which are the, the action that you use to uh, to get these, oh, sorry, which are the action that you use to produce this bandit feedback. So you don't have to do anything else. So they already submit these actions to the environment. So the action, actual sequence of play will converge almost surely to a critical points of the game under these condition. The basic saying that you have to choose the step size and also the query radius carefully. And the second result saying that, well, for merely monotone games, which if you recall, is a type of game that neither contain nor is contained by the suitor monotone plus game. But this class of game, the actual sequence of play, we don't have results showing its convergence to the critical point, but we can show that the agotic sequence, meaning that the historic and the average of the historical sequence value, average according to the step site will converge to a critical point. And we also have a convergence rate guarantee. This rate is in terms of certain performance metric called the merit function. And this merit function has the feature that uh, it, it's non negative everywhere and only take zero value uh, when you have a critical point there. So, Basically, trying to reach a critical point is the same as trying to drive the merit function to zero. And we can show that the merit function, the expected values of this one will go to zero at this rate. And so this is why you can see it's important to have gamma k, the step size, not decaying to zero too fast because the slower it's decay to zero, the faster the, the convergence rate that you have. And the third uh, Result saying that, uh, well, if you have a strongly monotone, which is uh, uh, all the, I mean, it's a much stronger property than the previous two, then applying our algorithm, we can show that the, the convergence, the actual sequence of play will converge at the rate in norm square given by this. And when you choose the step size and the query readers according to this, and it can be shown that, that you can choose each parameter carefully so that this rate can be as close to one over K as possible. That is actually pretty decent performance, especially considering that we don't have the gradient information. We only have uh, the bandit feedback. Just to compare our performance with the existing method. So the bottom one is our algorithm. We can show convergence for pseudo monotone plus and also for merely monotone if we use the agotic sequence. These are the existing words. You can see some of them will assume stronger conditions, strictly monotone, uh, stronger conditions on the game, strictly monotone, strongly monotone. There are two other assuming merely monotone, which is comparable to this, but they don't provide any convergence rate guarantee, even when the game are strongly monotone. But we do provide a guarantee that is very close to being one over K. And also for other words, 
uh, they provide guarantees that are slower. These two are slower. And also for this work here, it provides a slower rate of guarantee if you take a single query per iteration. Only when uh, you take two query per iteration, then it, it, it achieves a rate that is slightly faster than ours. I mean, that will be a cost that you have to pay. You have one additional query, which in pra practice may translate to, I mean, a lot of, uh, I mean, effort and also time delay, et cetera. All right, uh, so uh, let me uh, mention a couple of uh, examples to demonstrate these results. The first example is actually a, an optimization problem, which can be think of as a one player game. Uh, but we choose this one because, um, the, well, let me just briefly uh, go over this problem here. So this is trying to find the best portfolio distribution. So different asset, which, what is the allocations of your money onto these different asset there? And this is given by the Z vector, which take value in a probability simplex there. And C is the random rate of return. Mu is the expected rate of return. So basically this is the constraint, which saying that the, under the constraint that the expected rate of returns should exceed at least R level. Uh, how do I maximize the probabilities of exceeding that expected return, the actual random return that I get exceeding that expected return there. And this is the cost function to minimize. And it is not a convex function. It is only pseudo convex. And so when you think of this one as a game, and it's lies somewhere between pseudo monotone and pseudo monotone plus. It's not pseudo monotone plus. So literally speaking, it does not fall into theorem one where we prove almost sure convergence, but we test the algorithm anyway. And then we can see that the algorithm indeed converge. The blue curve is the relevant one. The cost function will indeed converge to the optimal cost function eventually. So it just simply means that the algorithm will work actually even for the one given in a condition there. In the second example, we consider an optimization problem. For example, a curve fitting problem here, linear square estimation well, with large size, for example. And this is the minimization problem. And um, the, the um, I can formulate, reformulate this one as a uh, subtle point problem by introducing the Lagrange multiplier. So that will become a two player uh, game there. And I just want to remind you that uh, for this example and the previous example, we don't know the functional form of this. And for this example, not only I, each player does not know the functional form of the objective function, also the each player will not know the decisions of the other player. For example, for player one, when he minimized this W, he doesn't know anything about the lambda value there. So that's the situation we are dealing with, uh, just to uh, remind you about that fact. Now, by applying the algorithm we have, the OMD and RMD, you can see that the um, this is actually a uh, nearly monotone game. So for this case, we used the ergodic sequence and we showed the convergence uh, in the merit function form there. So you can see that in both cases, uh, the merit function will converge to zero. And also the relative distance to the, the minimum solution, the optimal solution will also converge at a rate that is looks to be something um, very fast, uh, linear convergence, basically. All right, so the last example will be the building cluster. So we have a number of buildings and they form clusters. For example, in this case, I have 10 buildings. They form three clusters here. Now, uh, the power usage of all the buildings within each cluster will be used to compute a peak value during a given period of time. And that peak value will incur a demand charge that will be distributed to the individual building in this cluster in a proper way. If the building belongs to multiple cluster, then he may have multiple demand charge attributed to him. And so now uh, this is a game that uh, uh, 
um, where you uh, we uh, will have these complicated uh, kind of a, uh, interacting uh, correlated objective function. And so we consider the case of the previous 10 building case and also three cluster. And assuming that the, the decision of each building will just simply be two time slot, the power uses during a two time slot. The next slide will show four time slot. And so in this case, we have, we do have a strongly monotone game. And we can apply theorem three to uh, provide a convergence rate guarantees of our algorithm. And so as you can see here, we show the convergence of algorithm, the relative distance to the optimal solution. And the only critical points of the game, basically. Uh, so the green one is the ON, uh, the ONMD, and, and RMD algorithm using the same set of parameters. So this is actually two curves for the, for the OMD and RMD. And the, the yellow one is also two cur curves for the OMD and RMD dual proposed algorithm using a different set of uh, parameter. This other curve will show the, the existing algorithm, the performance. As you can see, our algorithm definitely outperformed the existing one, at least for this given example. And this is just the case where each building will have four uh, slots to uh, determine the power usage there. So for uh, each, uh, each the action space of each building will be four, there's 10 building the total will be 40 there. All right, so that concludes my first part here. So, um, the second part, I will go over only briefly because of the limited amount of time left. Uh, so like I said, um, so the previous part assumed that I, once the different players submit an action, uh, then the bandit feedback for different player will be immediately received for the pseudo gradient estimation. But in reality, this may take some time. Uh, I mean, that could be the inherent delay in the environment or could be communication delay, et cetera. So there will be delay. And this delay may also be different across different players. And the delay could also grow unboundedly as you move forward in time. So all these situations we have considered, so these are the two possible scenarios we consider. One is different players will have different delay, but all upper bounded by a constant. The other one will be the different player will be delayed by the same amount, but that amount, the upper bound can grow sublinearly in K, uh, slower than linear. Uh, so that's the uh, two different scenario we consider. In this case, um, we, can, we want to still use the same estimation scheme, but as you can see, uh, because sometimes you may, you, you need two consecutive uh, this bandit feedback to get one estimate. But due to the delay, at some time you don't receive any feedback and at other time you see multiple feedback. And so this information may not be available all the time. So we need to develop two caches, one to store the bandit feedback. The other one to store, well, once two consecutive bandit feedbacks are received, they can be used to compute one estimate. That will be stored in a second cache here. And if this cache is unempty, then we can use that to perform a gradient descent step. So that's the idea. And so now the error will have three components. In addition to the systematic error, the bias, and also the variance, we also have this error due to the asynchronous uh, natures of receiving bandwidth among different uh, players there. So these three errors need to be contained control carefully. So I just directly mentioned the results. So we showed that for pseudo monotone plus game with those two situations uh, on delays, the actual sequence of play will converge almost surely to a critical point if we choose the step size, the query readers, and also carefully, and also assuming that the, um, the delay after bond grow according to a sublinear rate uh, that is satisfy all these conditions there. And uh, so 
there is a similar work based on STSA estimate. Uh, if you remember, that's one you mentioned earlier. That one only worked for strictly monotone, which is stronger than this. And also that one assumed a condition that is stronger than our result there. So we relax the condition and our result can be applied for a broader class of things. Uh, so here is just the building, same building example you see earlier. And uh, so this is the existing result. You can see that it doesn't even converge to the solution. But in our case, we converge. Uh, so you can see that this is the, uh, the, the green one is the, uh, the one that uh, with this growth rate of the delay. So the delay potentially could grow according to this polynomial there in time. But we can still handle that, maintain convergence to the critical point. And the yellow one is actually grow even faster. We our algorithm still kind of grow, uh, but it's hard to tell at this stage. But this is actually not satisfying the the theorem condition. So this is not uh, our our theorem. This simply does not predict the convergence for this case. All right. So I guess I will skip the last part. I'll just summarize the uh, the talk here. Uh, so as you can see, the, the solution we propose uh, try to utilize only bandwidth feedback, no information about the partial gradient, et cetera. And also the idea is to try to use as few bandwidth feedback as possible. And also try to pick a gradient distance scheme that can be, be, be applicable, can guarantee convergence for as broad a class of gain as possible. We achieve some of these objectives, I mean, but this is ongoing work. So this is something that we are still working on. And uh, so I'll just directly go to the end. Um, so some of the reference of this, uh, I mean, existing work is listed here. And also this is the paper that uh, we have written, uh, Matthew has, uh, has written. And uh, some of them, I mean, the first one, uh, I think is uh, under review by TAC, the other two things is by CDC. So uh, if you're interested, just send me an email. All right, so that's all I have. So I'll be glad to answer any questions. Yeah. I think we actually have an online session. Um, okay. Um, Will the result also hold for a uh, standard mirror descent? Said, I think that's the question, right? That's Marco decision process setting. Um, well, that's a good question. Um, so in this case, we assume the uh, continuous uh, multiplayer game where the action space is, can you, uh, when you have multi uh, Markov decision process, uh, so, well, I mean, the classical market decision process will be, uh, will be, uh, I guess, discrete in nature, in the state space, but it could also have continuous state space. Uh, yeah, that's something that uh, I'm not sure. I, I, I can't give a definite answer for this question. It's probably, um, let's see. Yeah. Um, so in that case, you, you are dealing with a dynamic problem rather than a stack problem there, right? And uh, so um, in our case, we assume that the game is fixed. And uh, the, the, for example, in the building example, we assume that uh, the action, the decision by each building is the sequence of control action over the whole time horizon, uh, not rather than treating this one as a dynamic problem to decide the first stage action first and a second stage action, a third stage action. So uh, this is the perspective. I will imagine that will be, when, once you try to translate to a dynamic setting, that will be, uh, I mean, I don't know, uh, much more difficult, uh, probably very challenging. Right. Yeah, hope that answered the questions. Yeah, okay. So I have a question. Uh, so thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, so there was this theory where you showed that the ergodic sequence converges uh, right. with delta rate, right? So right. I was wondering if we uh, consider the full information case, uh, 
Is it possible to show last year's convergence for that scenario, or there is still a need to define on the energy sequence that convergence? Oh, right. right. So you are saying that I can bring that. This is maybe not turning to. Oops. Yes. This one here, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. So you're saying that uh, using the um, so this is assuming that using the, the estimated uh, uh, pseudo gradient, if you use the true uh, pseudo gradient together with, the, for example, the extra gradient uh, approach uh, for merely monotone game, I think that, uh, there. Are, uh, I can't say uh, exactly, but I think that there will there are results showing that uh, indeed you can guarantee the convergence of the the actual pace of the sequence there, right? Right. Yeah, but uh, here we assume that, uh, I mean, using uh, just use the estimated gradient peak. So the, the estimation error is the main thing that prevents uh, us having the actual payoff uh, sequ uh, sequence of pay so to converge almost surely, right? So the, the, the last part, uh, the, the fourth part I didn't mention will be dealing with merely monotone games. And uh, so we can show almost short convergence uh, for the actual sequence of play, but that is under the assumption that we take multiple queries and then take the average to reduce the variance. So that comes as a huge cost, of course, uh, because the number of queries actually is in some case may grow with the step uh, time step K there. So you, I mean, that's really not appealing solution either. There. But that's something that you, you have to pay to Ensure the actual sequence of play to convert for merely monotone games. Right. Right. Maybe I can ask my questions. Right. Um, so, um, thanks, thanks for the insightful talk. Um, I would say, you know, one way to interpret all these results is really thinking about everything, all these algorithms have on the computer. You are doing a simulation and trying to figure out what where is the equilibrium, equilibrium of game or maybe the critical point of game. But I think one of the motivation of moving to this bandit setting is really you are trying to say, hey, I don't know the objective function, so people have to pull the bandit to do the experiment, figure out what is the, the cost of the reward. So in that sense, people are actually playing this out in the real world, and they people are doing sequential gameplay in that sense. So is there any analysis trying to say, okay, maybe this algorithm is strategy proof in the sense that can I have like one of the agents, maybe all the other agents are in your average, but one of the agents just maybe he can try to block the convergence of the average for his own purpose. Is there any analysis? Like that? Okay, so you mean that there is some malicious agent there uh, that will try to, I mean, try maybe, to maybe not malicious, just, just rational. Oh, rational. Okay. They, they want, they want so take advantage of this. That's right. Yeah, that's a good question there. Uh, yeah, that the um, so this is assuming that the uh, everybody's own objective will be um, just to uh, minimize his own uh, objective function. So, uh, so you are saying that if somebody, um, if everybody else will adopt this strategy, uh, the, the proposed algorithm, uh, but there's one that uh, may choose a different strategy that may, uh, may benefit himself only. Uh, that's certainly possible. Uh, yeah, that's unfortunately the case there. Right. Yeah. yeah, and as you mentioned, the also uh, in practice, uh, you for example, in a traffic city traffic driving example, I mean different driver driver drivers so will try to receive bandit feedback in a form. So, for example, Google Map predicted travel time there. That's the feedback that you receive, and uh, he will then decide on a route even you know, for the next five minutes, for example, and then take a decision and then move to a new location and receive a new bandit feedback from the new location there. And then, so that will be, a, like you said, a recursive kind of a procedure there. You will have to do this one repeatedly there. So that's the, so analyzing the performance of the algorithm, assuming that each stage is using this kind of algorithm and analyzing the performance of that um, in this recursive setting, I think that will be a few interesting future direction. There. Is that not how everyone uses Google Maps? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like. Yeah. I 
to have another cluster. Right. Uh, so, so what is the consideration to have one building belong to two different clusters? Are you saying that you have to pay the bill twice? Or uh, well, uh, this example was taken from a paper from a uh, CDC uh, by a former graduate student at M who worked with me before. And uh, so I think, uh, I mean, it's just to demonstrate that you can do that. But certainly you can have different uh, uh, non-overlapping cluster, mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes the, um, the I mean, it's just be, maybe be because of the variations of the building that belongs to multiple groups. For example, if, if that building may belongs to both the Purdue campus or it also belongs to a local utility, I mean, provided region there. So that may, uh, also, be the case. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think definitely you need to make a problem. But in that particular case, probably you want to split that, you know, whatever energy consumption to two different meters. Right. It should probably never double come. Right, right. Otherwise, it does not make sense. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Maybe the advice. Yeah, but completely, I can just think that there's only one cost right there. This is more like a yes, we can. Why not? Do you have time for the final? Um, yeah, sure. Okay, I just have a question about this extra gradient which I have brought. So it was, it looked like it's looking at the future gradients in the update. But then I want to see how it compares to like momentum based gradients. And when you're kind of looking at the past gradients in the update, and um, in more accelerated way, do they seem related, but maybe different views if there is any unification of the two, or even if it makes sense to do momentum based? Right. Uh, so, yes. So this is, you're saying that instead of using a future, a gradient to do the gradient descent from the current point, uh, use the past gradient information. Yeah, that's a, a interesting question. I can't say which one definitely will outperform the other. Uh, I mean, probably it depends on the kind of a problem you're looking at, but uh, the momentum typically will, I think it will also, in some cases will help the convergence property compared to the straightforward uh, mirror descent algorithm there. Uh, it, it's just that I can't say, I mean, so what will be the situation exactly that this will be better than the other one. So it's probably depends on a different scenario there, right? But that's indeed another uh, option to consider when um, deciding on the, the, the gradient descent scheme for that uh, Bennett-based learning algorithm, right? Right, yeah. Any other questions? Thank you.